they understand how much of what they enjoy has has been informed, influenced, discovered because of that. Mm. I think you make some noise about it, but I, 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 I have a hard time seeing that becoming an actual problem. Yeah, I think it's going to be – it's a point of outrage for some people, particularly animal rights people. But that is the nature of a lot of those experiments. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that kind of shit, like neural implants? You ever thought about it? You no. looked into it? No. I mean, I might have read some things about it, but no, I don't have an opinion about it because I, I don't understand. I'd have to have a question put to me, I guess, but I don't understand it enough to have an opinion about it. It's a weird thing, and it's probably going to be the future. It's, it's probably going to inevitably, whether it's 50 years from now or five years from now, they're going to be doing that. They're going to be doing that to people. Putting it in you with what in mind? Enhancing your access to information. Got it. Increasing the bandwidth that the human mind has to information. Initially, it'll be for people with injuries. It uh, apparently uh, can be used for people with uh, paralysis, and they'll be able to uh, use, you know, I'm going to crudely describe this for anybody who's an actual scientist. They're going to be able to, people that no longer have, uh, their spinal column has been severed. They're going to be able to bypass that and allow you to have access to your limbs Got it. with this technology. So initially, it'll have some very acceptable applications where people go, this is great. This is groundbreaking. People who are paralyzed can now walk. But then ultimately, what Elon said to me is you're going to be able to speak without using words. So there's going to be some sort of an interface that people have with each other. That's going. They're going to be able to be connected, whether it's through the internet or some other broadband type of technology. You're going to be able to access information, communicate with each other, and do all of it through these devices. I hope that thinking part you can turn off and on when you want, man. <laughs> Make arguing with your wife be a disaster, dude. <laughs> well, just access to the internet. Imagine access to everyone's opinions. Turn on your notifications for yeah. the whole world, and they're all inside your head. Sure. Fuck. So, no, I don't like the sounds of that. No. The, the, but the disease stuff, for yes, sure. Sure. Who's going to sure. argue against it? That that puts you in a weird, that puts you always in a moral bind would be, um, you know, you kind of get into like, well, you know, AI makes me very uneasy. However, when put to use for national security or, right. no, they want to put an implant in your brain. Okay, but what about uh, allowing this this child who's never walked, this child who's never seen to see? Oh, yeah, well, in that case. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things that you do is you interface with the natural world in a way that most human beings don't. You're constantly in the wilderness. You're mm -hmm. constantly uh, among, among wild animals in these wild places. And you have a very different view of society and a very different view of just life than most people do, I think, because of that. Yeah, I think that that I think that that stuff. Inf I definitely think it informs it. Yeah, I, th I yeah. <clears throat> I've tried to capture this in various ways too, but I I I think of uh, I I think uh, I look for the ways in which I think though of humans in, in which humans are still animals. I mean, we just we are like empirically right. You know, you can't deny it. Right. But no one no one would come and say, you know, no one would come and argue that, you know, we're not a mammal. OK. I, I just see the ways in which um, we're governed by similar impulses or in ways which our experiences aren't that different from that. And, and I embrace it, you know, um, I embrace it. I try to get my I try to help my kids to see it as well. Mm. And I think in some ways it causes, in some ways that you, in explaining things to kids or and think about yourself, you you commit the uh, what, what some people might regard as the crime of anthropomorphism, right? Where you, uh, where you give animals human attributes, human feelings, but when I'm looking at wildlife with my kids, I do it all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever that buck is jealous of that other buck, right? Right. You just that, that's that's just how you that's how 
will naturally talk about what's going on in front of us around animals, you know? Yeah. They're, that bear is nervous about that other bear. You know, you just talk about it like you're watching interactions. And so, uh, you know, I try to invite that level of looking at, I try to invite that level of looking at the outdoors and the way of looking at wilderness because I think it makes you, it, it helps you be more connected to it. Gives you a reference. Yeah, it helps you yeah. be more connected to it. I watched a video today of a wild goat that was breeding with a, what do you call a female wild goat? Nanny? Yeah. Yeah, Billy's and Nannies. Yeah. And then, uh, um, yeah, Billy's so and Nannies. The wild goat was breeding with this female wild goat, and right next to him, like 20 feet away, was another wild goat breeding with another female goat. And this guy dismounts. Runs over and knocks that goat over, just charges in the in the middle of sex, and just blasts this other goat and knocks him down. Sure, it's like no, no, no. I'm the only one who gets to fuck. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's some kind of jealousy going yeah, on. With so goats. I would love, I would love to watch that play out with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things I like about it too. Is you can wind up, uh, God, you can talk about rich stuff. Yeah. You know, watching it. You talk about rich stuff with kids, man. Watching animals, you know? Oh, yeah. There's so much to talk about. I mean, that world is so fascinating. And, you know, for many people, you get a little taste of it from documentaries, maybe a little internet clip here or there, or, you know, you see animals at the zoo. You have mm-hmm. very little exposure to what it what it's like to be around them in real life. You know, I didn't spend a lot. I mean, I, I fished when I was younger, but I didn't spend a lot of time um, in the wild, um, uh, near wild animals. And I remember when you and I went on that first trip to Montana, the, the moment where, uh, I shot that buck, which is the first animal I've ever killed. And that moment where like I locked eyes on it and we're in the wild and you see this thing and it was a totally unusual experience. I remember thinking like, this is almost like bizarrely almost like psychedelic because the world this world is so different than any other aspect of the world the world where you're you're sneaking up on an animal you're trying to be undetected it spots you you look at them you know what's up they kind of know something's wrong and you're like locked into this completely different vibration of existence mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, but this is very bizarre. This is a very bizarre state. It's a state of mind. And I feel like it's also a, like a very bizarre state of mind that's recognizable. It's like a little door that you didn't even know you had in your room, in, in your house. Like, what's in this door? Yep. And you open the door like, oh, this is the hunter door. You didn't even know you had that door. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're in there. I, I equate it with people. I tell people all the time, I go, you know that feeling that you get? When you go fishing, most people know that feeling. When you catch a fish and everything just gets excited, like, oh, 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 that is a feeling that's like deeply embedded in the human reward system. There's something that tells you this, this is a great thing because now you are going to catch a fish and that fish is going to feed your family. You're going to exist. You're going to live. You're going to thrive. Whereas if you didn't catch a fish, you didn't get anything. Yeah. It's an almost illogical lighting up of your system. Oh, it speaks to me in a big way. And a bi- everybody, to everyone. To kids, it does. Yeah. You know, um, my youngest, I, I took her fishing when she was like five years old. She t- caught a uh, six-pound bass, fucking huge bass for her. And she's like holding this thing, like the, the look on her face, the excitement of it all. It's like it does something to people that is like deeply ingrained in us. You know, it, it just ignites this thing that's a part of you that you didn't know was there. I think as well, you get uh, in observing wildlife, being around wildlife, trying to get up on it and kill it and at times. Man, you get invited into just a different uh, pacing. Yeah. When I was, we have a youth deer season. So I was hunting youth deer season with my kids this year. And we watched a deer. He was quite a ways off. But he had climbed up into view and was standing on this little ridge. And something caught it. He was going away from us, probably six, 700 yards away. And he climbed up this ridge and something caught his attention on the other side of the ridge. And he locked up. 
mean locked up, locked up, standing there. Not like he not, he didn't get into a position where he decided he was comfortable. He just froze his step because something caught his attention, and that deer for didn't move. I mean, didn't move a foot for twenty two minutes. Wow! It, it didn't was... move. It, it didn't move its head. It didn't move its feet. It stood exactly dead still for 22 minutes. You think it was like a mountain lion or something? I have no so? idea. He, I, I, it was too far away. He just knew some, he, something was that caught his eye and held that position without settling in. And then at 22 minutes, it looked left. <laughs> That's so bad. I'm not kidding you. When it got dark and we left, that deer was still standing there. But he wow. looked left. He broke his gaze. And you're like, and then to, to be tangled up in that, it's like, wow, man, just the level of perception yeah. and concentration and focus and the way that time, it's so hard to understand how time moves. You can't understand how time moves for stuff. You know, you'll find in the wintertime, you'll find where a grouse will get snowed on. So it's already in, in its place and then it snows a foot. And so you'll jump the grouse out of the snow. There's no tracks leading to where it was. It snowed on it. It stayed there, sometimes for days. And we'll have dozens of pellets, dozens of shit pellets underneath it. And then busts out of the snow and flies away. And it had been where it was sitting and got snowed on, covered in snow, waited there, shat I don't know how many times over how many days, and then poof. Wow. flies out of there just the passage of time the passage of time you can't even begin to understand it imagine that existence where every minute of every day you're wondering if something's going to eat you yeah i don't know i'd love to get into it for a minute i'd love <laughs> to get into it for a minute which animal i'd would love you to like into? understand like if you could understand for a bull or a buck or whatever like how they feel like how they feel sexual desire like mm. what does it feel like? Is it mostly comp? Is it like mostly? Com is it mostly a competitive feeling? Mm. Do you know what I mean is it mostly competition? I don't think it's like um, I don't know. Is it? I don't think it's passion. <laughs> you know? like, right. What does it feel like? Well, it's definitely not how you know. It's not love. That's probably one of the weird things about human animals as opposed to other animals. Is that our our sex is intertwined with compassion and love? Yeah, for for the vast majority of people, yes. Yeah, for the vast majority of people, yes. Whereas with them, it's a pure desire to spread the DNA mm -hmm. at all costs. Yeah, at all costs, or mostly all costs. Yeah, it's gotta be wild. It's no, gotta, love, no. Like, uh, bulls in the rut, and especially when you consider that it only happens once a year. Yeah, that's gotta be insane. Where this overwhelming urge. All year round, they're not horny at all. Yeah, they don't even engage in any kind of sexual satisfaction at all. And then September rolls around, and shit gets wild. Yeah, got blue balls by then. <laughs> just, but it's just strange how nature works. How it coincides with the seasons, so that the the you know the calves will be born in the spring, and it's, it's so weird. Have you read Dan Flory's new book? No, I haven't heard about I've, I've heard about it, rather, no. but I haven't read it. Wild New World? He contacted me the other day. I he joked with him one. where, when I was reading it, I want to make a annotated version where I have commentary, where I do all the footnotes. Because <laughs> <laughs> I want to be like, well, yeah, but, I mean, you, know, you also got to consider this. The whole time I'm reading the book, I'm like, yeah, but Dan, you can't say that without saying this. What is it? What is the premise of the book? Well, okay, it, it's a the, the premise. It's the story. So his new book, Wild New World, is a history of human animal interactions, and it basically begins with the Chicxulub strike. Okay, Chicxulub. Yeah, it's a great word. I, I didn't know the word till I read his book. The Chicxulub strike. It's the impact strike in the. Um, it's the impact strike in the Yucatan. Oh. That. that Kills the dinosaurs. Kills the dinosaurs, okay. So it begins with the chicks loop strike because what he's trying to do, he's trying to find a place to get into the the American menagerie, okay, American wildlife. Mm. So he just starts there uh. where you have, you know, you, you, you kind of like wipe the slate clean, right, and you, and you bring in – because he's trying to he's trying to explain like how does North America have its bestiary, and he just finds that as a good place to enter the narrative about how we have the animals we have, where we got the American bestiary from. Um, and it covers up until like yesterday. 
It, it, it covers up to like the wolf reintroduction, the, the battle, the current battle over wolf re- reintroduction. So mm. it just is a story of humans and humans and wildlife in America. Um, he, sp- he, he spends a lot of time on some things that, that, that I interviewed him at a bookstore and, and um, he sp- I, I was kind of busting his balls about some things he does in the book that I didn't like. But uh, areas where I disagreed with him. But he spends a lot of time on um, – not a lot of time. Toward the end, he, he talks a lot about the individuality in animals. Okay. Hmm. Uh, us not having room or us not sort of like humans not allowing space for individualities in animals. Right. Now, I think at one point he talks about his dog. He's like, this, this, there's no other dog like this dog. There's no other dog that knows what this dog knows. There's no other dog that has the history this dog has. There's no other dog that processes the information around it in the way that this dog processes the information around it. Why would we not extend that same thing to animals in the wild? Mm. So yeah, we would have to. You can't, you can't ignore the question. Right. You can't ignore the question. Right. There has to be individuality amongst wild species. I think some have tremendous individuality, and I have to feel that some don't have as much. <laughs> like maybe trout. <laughs> yeah. Like, the, the, yeah, on the, on the, if you put on a spectrum, like microbial, for, forget microbial life. If you put it on a spectrum, um, 